Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Yes. Okay, let me see if I can make this work. Yes, yes. Um, reflection on the Baha'i principle of harmony of science and religion. This presentation is inspired by one of the fundamental principles of the Baha'i faith, the harmony of science and religion. The harmony of science and religion is an intriguing, fascinating principle, which for long has been sidestepped and evaded. Now is the time to reflect on this principle. Among the world's great religions, the Baha'i faith unequivocally promotes and champions emphatically the harmony of science and religion by designating it as one of its fundamental principles. I need to explain at this outset that to date, I have attended several of these wonderful and inspiring gatherings offered through the sessions organized by Forus Hanum. I have been much inspired and moved by them. In particular, I remember several sessions presented by my dear brother, Mujan Khadem, that subsequently led to inspiring questions, discussions, and a vibrant discourse. Each time the audience, as well as myself, have been moved by the poetry and the mysticism of those presentations and their ensuing discussions. Hence, when Farooz Khanum invited me to present at this fireside setting, I reflected much on what I could possibly offer before such a gathering. I suggested few themes, titles, explaining that my background, interests, and research and studies in the past years have been centered on science, the relevance and impact of certain understandings therein, to spiritual matters and concepts. So I offered her a list on several possible titles. She selected this particular one for this evening's presentation. Hence I obey through a presentation that I hope can intrigue, inform and fascinate this audience by placing science and religion side by side as two essential dimensions of an integral whole. That is the poetry of religion side by side with the rationality and knowledge derived from science. Hence, this is not dichotomy, but rather agreement and reinforcement between science and religion. Thus, in this presentation, we reflect on whether science and religion can continue to work together in harmony in view of the main concerns of this presentation the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology, in particular by the biotechnology of genetic engineering to the principle of the harmony of science and religion. Though this presentation is essentially scientific, nevertheless, I do hope and anticipate that the poetry of this presentation comes through. This presentation will employ throughout the use of PowerPoint, PowerPoint facilitates clarity and order. Foremost, it provides valuable means for inclusion on each respective slide, the sources of information and citations used throughout this talk. This talk represents my perspective, my reflections on the Baha'i principle of the harmony of science and religion, a theme relevant to our specific times. May this presentation generate much interest as to inspire the viewers to explore, investigate, and reflect on the Baha'i faith and this fundamental teaching. The principles of the Baha'i faith are precisely in tune with this global age. At the start, before diving into this theme, few words of explanation are in order as to why I wish to highlight the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology. In particular, this theme is at the center of an important public discourse of our times. <clears throat> the supreme governing body of the Baha'i faith has encouraged 
the engagement of Baha'is in public discourse. This talk is centered on one of the outstanding discourses of our times that relates directly to the fundamental Baha'i principle, the harmony of science and religion, hence its emphasis through this presentation. Additionally, the key words biotechnology and genetic engineering are among the most highly searched keywords in YouTube searches. Thereby, I wish to offer my understanding, my perspective on this highly searched, vital, and timely theme. May this presentation generate such interest as to inspire the viewers to explore, investigate, and reflect on the Baha'i faith and this fundamental teaching. The principles of the Baha'i faith are precisely in tune with our global age. First, I wish to reflect on the Baha'i principle of the harmony of science and religion. Next, I plan to bring to the attention of the viewers the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology, notably by the biotechnology of genetic engineering. In conclusion, I wish to bring forth reflections on the stance of the Baha'i faith on the harmony of science and religion. The ethical challenge posed by biotechnology compels our in-depth reflection. On the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology, notably by the biotechnology of genetic engineering. Such reflections lead to a fundamental question. Are science and religion in opposition to one another or are they in harmony with one another? Science and religion each has been a significant force in human history, essential to the development of societies, civilizations, and cultures. Yet often science and religion are viewed in opposition to one another. Science and religion are as two mighty forces. They are as two waves surging toward the development and advancement of civilizations. Thus, harmony of science and religion inspires an in-depth reflection. Science and religion are as seemingly divergent waves that originate from the same source. They arise from the same source as two mighty waves. These two waves, religion and science, cannot be separated they are intertwined with each other. They are as two waves, two mighty forces in the development and progress of civilizations. As two sweeping divergent waves arising from the same source. Sweeping waves of science and religion originate from the same source. Religion and science are not separate from each other. Rather, they are intertwined. Indeed, they may be viewed as mighty waves that move onward as convergent waves. As convergent waves, they progress toward the advancement of civilization. Should these sweeping waves converge in harmony, they can generate a tremendous force, lending a powerful impetus to the advance of civilizations. Historically, science and religion have been viewed in opposition to one another. I wish to emphasize that the fundamental principle of the Baha'i faith, the harmony of science and religion, is emphasized and affirmed by following few selections from the Baha'i sacred writings. Religion and science are intertwined with each other and cannot be separated. These are the two wings with which humanity must fly. Religion must be reasonable. It must agree with science perfectly, so that science shall sanction religion and religion sanction science. If we say religion is opposed to science, we lack knowledge of either true science or true religion, for both are founded upon the premises and conclusions of reason, and both must bear its test. Enlightened and inspired by these writings, we can pose the key question, are science and religion dissonant 
or in harmony. Traditionally, science and religion, dissonant or in harmony, is a question that over centuries has been the cause of much contention, a contention that has continued to the present, a time when great advances in science, technology, and innovations have been achieved. A related question is, are science and religion at odds with one another, or are they complementary and supportive of one another? Both science and religion are centered on what is believed to be the truth, in one respect relating to the physical phenomena, and in other respect relating to spiritual truths. Thus we ask, are science and religion in competition, or in cooperation, or in synergy? Are they complementary and supportive of one another? We can probe the question of the harmony between science and religion through several approaches. Traditionally, for long it was assumed that science and religion are at opposing poles and that never shall the twain meet. Science relates to operation of those universal laws of nature. For those who believe in a religion, religion relates to spiritual laws and principles. One of the fundamental reasons that science and religion have been viewed in opposition to one another is due to lack of understanding or misinterpretation of metaphors, analogies, and similes used in religious texts. These have been taken literally, though they hold profound insights and have layers of meaning whose depths may be fathomed through thoughtful reflection. Lack of understanding of numerous metaphors in the Judeo-Christian as well as in other sacred texts, Zoroastrian, Hindu, and Muslim, are factors that have contributed to such misperceptions. Historically, on one hand, contention between science and religion has deterred women and men of science from partaking of the wisdom and riches that religions can impart. On the other hand, it has hindered many women and men dedicated to a religion from the enrichment that science can impart toward understanding the mysteries of life and enhancement of the quality of life. At one time, a talk on science and religion would have likely centered on a literal understanding of certain religious texts, such as the story of creation in seven days, the Garden of Eden, the question of evil and good, and numerous other examples. Abdul Baha, one of the central figures of the Baha'i faith, through his talks and writings, sheds insights on these things. Some of these are to be found in a remarkable book known as Some Answered Questions. He sheds insights by explaining the inner meaning of these metaphors. Yet there are those who insist on the inerrancy of a literal understanding of the sacred text, such as the story of creation, exclusivity of salvation, and others. In our times, the literal understanding of such metaphors no longer merit serious consideration. Interpretations of sacred texts go well beyond the literal. In current times, we are well beyond a literal understanding of such metaphors and analogies. There are novel challenges to be met in our times. In particular, advancement in science and technology compel insightful reflection on the by principle of the harmony of science and religion. On the Baha'i principle of the harmony of science and religion, during our times, special challenges are posed to this principle, in particular by the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology. Among these biotechnologies, notably by the biotechnology of genetic engineering. Now this prompts an in-depth reflection on the biotechnology of genetic engineering. That is regarding ethical and spiritual standpoint in bringing together material and spiritual civilizations. I quote from Baha'i sacred writings. Although material civilization 
is one of the means for the progress of the world of mankind, yet until it becomes combined with divine civilization, the desired result, which is the felicity of mankind, will not be attained. In our times, momentous advancements have been achieved in biotechnology. This prompts us to ponder whether biotechnologies hold prospect for human well-being. Their benefits are significant, among them identification of the genetic base of disease, eradication of certain genetic diseases, development of therapies, prolongation of human life, and much more. Or whether biotechnologies foreshadow unfavorable outcomes toward human detriment. Few among their unfavorable, even ominous implications are human cloning, eugenics, and generation of biohazards. As the gene is at the foundation of heredity, we are faced with multitude of issues and concerns. At this point, it is important first to briefly overview some of the historical background on human heredity. Early groundbreaking studies include the work of Charles Darwin with its implication on inherited traits presented in 1856. The work of Gregor Mendel on pea hybrids presented in 1863. William Bateson foresaw that the science of heredity would lead to great discoveries and that its power would be applied to control the composition of a nation. Thus, Bateson first introduced the concept of eugenics. Whether such control would ultimately be good or bad for that nation or for humanity at large was considered a separate question. Francis Galton coined the word eugenics in 1904. Herein again is reference to the concept of eugenics. That is the purpose of eugenics was to accelerate the selection of the well-fitted over the ill-fitted. It may be defined as the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable heritable characteristics. Eugenics has horrific implications. A few years later in 1912, Alfred Plotz, a German physician, biologist, eugenicist, coined the term racial hygiene and promoted the horrific concept of racial cleansing in Germany. In fact, the United States has also been tainted in respect to eugenics. Genetic cleansing was promoted between 1927 and 1972 through the sterilization of some women identified as imbeciles. Regarding this case known as Buck versus Bell in 1922, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Virginia's law was constitutional and that Carrie Buck, one of these women, should be sterilized. Her sterilization was the first of approximately 8,300 performed under the law between 1927 and 1972. Eugenics has horrific implications. At this point, I wish to take a brief look at certain landmarks in the development of the science of heredity. Early on, Aristotle recognized that heredity is as a current of information moving across generations. Gregor Mendel in 1866, his work resulted in Mendelian genetics. The discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953 was revolutionary. It led to molecular genetics. Molecular genetics has ever since dominated the field of genetics with its revolutionizing effect, leading to the development of some remarkable biotechnologies. With the emergence of molecular genetics, we are faced with a challenge. Challenges that on one hand are auspicious, 
with immense possibilities, yet on the other hand, they also pose the dilemma. Thus, they pose both the challenge and the dilemma. The new discoveries in biotechnology were hailed with great enthusiasm by some passionately as the ultimate experiment, man-made evolution, the brave new world of genetic engineering. The brave new world refers to a dystopian novel written by the English author Aldous Huxley in 1931 and published in 1932. This book was published some 20 years before the structure of DNA was decided. Aldous Huxley foresaw that which was on the horizon could lead to a dystopian future with its horrific implications. <clears throat> Yet others foresaw the new findings auspicious, a boon to humankind. In time, it led to the discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953. That discovery was enthusiastically hailed, alchemy revived, improving nature, harnessing the gene, and remaking the world. Why such discordant views? Which of the two did the new discoveries portend? Was it a blessing, boon, or was it dismal gloom? Which is it? Could it be both, boon and also gloom? As it relates to the theme of this presentation, the harmony of science and religion, boon and also gloom? First, I plan to briefly overview the boon the advantages, the favorable outcome of this technology, the benefits, life-saving benefits of some of the discoveries, advances at the forefront that have been made possible through biotechnology. Next, I want to reflect on the possible disadvantages, the unfavorable outcome of biotechnology, that is the gloom, harmful effects, which can last over generations, extending beyond this to future generations. Now an overview of certain advances at the forefront in biotechnology. Some of these advances are a boon. They hold outcomes that are beneficial to human well-being. Some others are dismal, gloom. They portend detrimental outcomes. Now an overview of advances at the forefront. The discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953. Several biotechnologies, among them recombinant DNA, gene cloning, stem cell research, and genetic engineering, hold prospects for human well-being, yet can also have detrimental outcomes. Their significant benefits include identification of the genetic base of disease, development of therapies, prolongation of human life, and much more. However, among their unfavorable implications are eugenics, gene enhancement, human cloning, and the generation of biohazards. These advances, with their significant benefits, as well as their unfavorable implications, are the outcomes of the discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953. The discovery of the structure of DNA was revolutionary. In 1962, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins. What left out the most principal figure, Rosalind Franklin, who had died in 1958 at the age of 37. This is an exciting, a fascinating story, yet it's egregious. It is fascinating because of how it happened that aha moment, that eureka moment of sudden discovery, it is egregious because the process ultimately left out the major contributor, Dr. Rosalind Franklin, as one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize. Dr. Franklin had died before the prize was awarded. The Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. I wish to relate the fascinating story of this monumental discovery leading to the eureka moment of that sudden discovery. How so? Researchers in this field, James Watson and Francis Crick, were conducted by Maurice Wilkins, 
the director of the King's College Lab in London, and shown the data, the crystallographic data studies of Dr. Russell Franklin. Let us now look at that key study, the fundamental data, the key image which divulged the structure of DNA. The discovery of the structure of DNA was based on the data, the research of Rosalind Franklin, the X-ray diffraction image of DNA. Viewing this image led to that eureka moment for Watson and Crick. Over the years, various models of DNA had been proposed as a single strand or as a triple strand and so on. However, it was the data, this image of DNA, of Dr. Franklin, which at long last divulged the model of DNA. It became immediately clear that DNA must be in form of two strands, the double helix. How so? This was based on the observation of this image on the left, the crystallographic image of DNA, obtained through X-ray diffraction studies. The distinctive X in this image divulged the pattern of a double helix. James Watson and Francis Crick became excited and giddy after viewing this image of DNA. They now had the view of the essential image of the molecular structure of DNA. They had that eureka moment. Immediately, they perceived the overall organization. So many of us experience that eureka moment when we suddenly experience, become aware of a long search for reality, whether a scientific discovery or a spiritual discovery. Through model building, things fell into place. With hammer and screws, things fell into place. The double helix structure of DNA of the two strands was at long last disclosed. So what did they do? What did Fram, James Watson and Francis Crick do? Through model building, using hammers and screws and metal plates, they unraveled the organization of the double-stranded model of DNA. This is a photograph of that model building. Shows James Watson and Francis Crick in state of awe and euphoria. All that model building. It, it led to that eureka moment. Sudden awareness. Then James Watson and Francis Crick went to the local pub, Eagle Pub, in Cambridge, near Cavendish Laboratory, to celebrate. A sign has been put up by Eagle Pub in Cambridge, acknowledging and celebrating that historic event. This pub, to this day, bears the distinction of its association with the discovery of the structure of DNA. They use the wording for DNA double helix, the secret of life. That was where they first announced the discovery of DNA, carrier of genetic information. So that was how it happened. That was what happened on February 28, 1953. That Francis Crick and James Thompson first announced their discovery of how DNA carries genetic information it had a great impact, a revolutionary impact. The DNA double helix, the secret of life. Having related this story, in the earnest of simplicity, I need not show in this setting the rather complex yet magnificent molecular image of the double-stranded DNA. Therefore, in the interest of avoiding undue complexities in this session, I will bypass showing and explaining the diagram of the molecular structure of DNA. The discovery of the structure of DNA, the secret of life has had a great impact, a revolutionary impact. Once the molecular structure of DNA was deciphered, it led to the development of biotechnologies with their immense possibilities. Biotechnology holds possibilities to improve human life, or also in some respect to deteriorate the conditions of the human species. Biotechnologies then hold possibilities to improve human life or deteriorate the conditions of the human species. 
The discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953 spurred a revolutionary progress in biotechnology. Biotechnology holds prospects for the welfare of humankind, but also portends detrimental outcomes. Their benefits are significant among them, identification of the genetic base of disease, eradication of genetic diseases, development of therapies, prolongation of human life, and much more. Their unfavorable implications are human cloning, eugenics, and biohazards. Among biotechnologies developed in the 20th century are few. Among them, these include recombinant DNA, gene editing, stem cell research, reproductive cloning. Some of these technologies hold prospects for the well-being of the human race, but can also have detrimental outcomes. Among their significant benefits are identification of the genetic base of disease, eradication of certain deadly diseases, development of drugs and therapies, prolongation of human life, refinement of the human genome, and much more. At this point, I wish to offer a few words on the intricate and elegant recombinant DNA biotechnology. This biotechnology has been a tremendous boon to humankind. Thus, it warrants brief explanation. This brilliant, intricate, and significant technology has made possible effective novel treatments for a number of diseases, recombinant DNA biotechnology. Recombinant DNA technology is an elegant biotechnology, which has been a tremendous boon to humankind. Thus, it warrants a brief explanation. This brilliant, intricate, and significant technology has made possible effective treatment for a number of diseases. It has been a boon to humankind. Briefly, two cells, that is, different segments of DNA, one from the host DNA and the other, the desired DNA, are combined under specific conditions. And here is just a schematic diagram of the recombined structure. The diagram shows the two segments of DNA in two colors. This is known as a chimera because it is the result of two genetically distinct sources. Then recombinants are treated, such as to significantly increase their number. By this means, through this technology, a large amount of the desired product coded by the inserted DNA can be obtained in pure form. This technology has been life-saving. Through this technology, vital therapeutic agents can be obtained in large amounts in pure form, such as blood clotting factor 8 deficient in hemophilia, insulin, and an ever-growing list of therapeutic agents. The importance of this significant biotechnology cannot be overemphasized. This fascinating technology is revolutionary. It provides vital agents for the treatment of a number of diseases. Thus, we can conclude that recombinant DNA technology is beneficial, therapeutic, life-saving, and highly moral. The early recombinant DNA experiments. At this point, I wish to introduce the humor, the significance, and the ethical concern which has been historically associated with this type of experiment. The early recombinant DNA experiments were historic and noteworthy in several respects. In 1972, Paul Berg created the first recombinant DNA chimera at Stanford. It was the result of combining DNA from two genetically distinct sources. Two years later, in 1974, Cohen and Boyer devised an amusing chimera. They transferred frog genes into bacterial cells. It became known as the frog prince experiment. Should you wish, I can explain that, the, the humor of that, at the end of this presentation, but I won't take the time right now. Aside from the strange humor therein, 
much learning has been gained from this experiment. Furthermore, this type of experiment also raised alerts about the ethical issues. Importantly, from the competent DNA experiment, much has been gained, specifically toward the treatment of a number of diseases and human well-being. Aside from the seeming absurdity of mixing the DNA from two species and the humor therein, the development of this type of technology, that is recombinant DNA technology, has been a boon. This technology serves for the synthesis and production of a number of vital therapeutic agents in highly purified form. Indeed, we can build a strong case that such technologies are a boon to humankind. Such technologies serve for the betterment of humankind. Thus, they can be highly moral and ethical. Thus, through recombinant DNA research, what has been achieved. As an example, in order to obtain insulin, essential in diabetes, one route was to obtain pancreas from a large number of cows. Pancreas is where insulin is produced. It was necessary to grind the collected pancreas organs, isolate and purify the insulin fraction. However, through employing recombinant DNA technology, large amounts of insulin can be obtained in highly pure form without sacrificing animals. Nevertheless, we can rightly ask, can such technologies lead to unethical outcomes? The first recombinant DNA experiment raised alerts about the ethical issues entailed in such experiments. It is heartening that the scientists themselves were at the forefront. Holberg, a leading researcher in the field of recombinant DNA and one of the recipients of the 1980 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, was the creator of the first DNA chimera, first expressed concern. He was alarmed by the inherent hazards of recombinant DNA technology. Together with several other noted scientists in the field, he raised serious concerns. This led to two conferences in Asilomar, California. To this second conference in 1975, lawyers and journalists were also invited. There was transparency. Berg summarized the data and outlined the scope of the problem. It was a volatile meeting. Lawyers spoke, scientists spoke, a unanimous decision was reached to place a temporary moratorium on recombinant DNA research. Other powerful genetic technologies were developed in the 21st century. These technologies have spurred scientific and medical revolution. One was the decoding of the entire human genome in 2003. I well remember that at the beginning of the 21st century, the excitement of it. It was about 50 years since the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule. This was the Human Genome Project, an international scientific research endeavor. It was formally launched in 1990, cost three billion, and was declared complete in 2003. We now know that the human genome, that's DNA, includes over 3 billion letters of DNA. It consists of 23 pairs of chromosomes and codes for 20,687 genes in total. It accommodates enough variation to make each one of us distinct and yet enough consistency to make each member of our species different from other species. The decoding of the entire human genome has been significant and extremely beneficial to human well-being. Once the human genome was deciphered, once it was deciphered, several significant technologies developed, notably among them, gene copying. Several significant fundamental technologies led to the technology of genetic engineering and gene editing. Among these, one in recent times has become quite familiar 
to the public. And it's known through the acronym CRISPR-Cas9. It's an elegant technology for gene editing. This work was revolutionary. There have been legal cases on who should receive the patent for it. This powerful technology enables genomic surgery, gene editing. A technique for gene editing. The possibilities of CRISPR are immense. If we know the DNA sequence related to a given organism, we can perform genomic surgery. The development of this technology for gene editing was the outcome of the research of a number of scientists. Among them, two remarkable women scientists were at the forefront. They made significant contributions. They were co-inventors of CRISPR technology. The 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to two women scientists for their groundbreaking work on gene editing. Jennifer Dutna and Emmanuel Charpentier, co-inventors of CRISPR technology at the forefront. Dr. Jennifer Dutna from University of California, Berkeley, and Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier, director of Max Planck Institute. There were also other researchers who made significant contributions to this field. The possibilities of CRISPR are enormous. Among these possibilities, some offer remarkable benefits with significant implications in the treatment of diseases and abnormalities. Some have worrisome implications as to their misuse. This technology enables genomic surgery. With genomic surgery, it is possible to chop, delete, add to, and revise the gene at will. This technology has the potential to eliminate certain genetic-based diseases. It enables development of novel therapies. However, this technology also has worrisome implications. Among them, eugenics already explained, that is improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of a desirable heritable characteristic and creation of biohazards and release them into the environment. We have certainly seen an example of that in the past several years and also currently with the virus, with the COVID virus, which was released into the environment more likely inadvertently. These worrisome implications also include generation of gene drives. On one hand, these biotechnologies cannot be overlooked or eliminated, as they can offer numerous benefits to humankind. Yet on the other hand, ethical and spiritual concerns continue to engage biologists, ethicists, and others. Concerns, ethical and spiritual. Significant ethical and spiritual concerns continue to face us with ethical and spiritual implications. Among these ethical and spiritual implications and concerns are eugenics, again explained previously, gene enhancement, which enables the selective enhancement of a special trait or characteristic. Thus, it can result in inequalities, evolution of a super race, possibly an undercurrent. Thus, it can result in inequalities, evolution of a super race and underclass. This brings to mind the emerging realities predicted by Aldous Huxley in his dystopian book, The Brave New World. Some associate this technology with creating what has been called designer babies. And then there's also reproductive cloning by two means use of somatic cells, cells other than the germline, or the germline. Use of embryonic stem cells has ethical implications. 
Both of these approaches provide benefits but also have ethical implications. In view of the lure and fascination of the most recent powerful genetic technologies developed in the 21st century, we can rightly ask whether scientists can or will continue to self-regulate. The ethical and spiritual implications of these technologies compel this question, can scientists self-regulate? To what extent should spirituality, moral principles, and ethics come into play? More importantly, how can they be enforced? How can they be regulated? Several fundamental ethical concerns emerge. Indeed, at this point in time, we are at the crossroads of science, ethics, and spirituality. This compels us to reflect on the standpoint of the Baha'i faith in respect to the harmony of science and religion. The standpoint of the Baha'i faith, this compels us to ask the question, are we moving closer to the brave new world of Aldous Huxley? Earlier in this talk, I made reference to the dystopian book of Aldous Huxley, The Brave New World, wherein Huxley anticipated ominous circumstances and scenarios. Can these indeed become realities? Or we ask, are we advancing toward the vision foreshadowed by Shobhi Effendi, the appointed guardian of the Baha'i faith? We have the guidance through the writings of Shobhi Effendi in the world order of Baha'u'llah regarding a world system guided and inspired by the vision expressed through the following guiding statements in the world order of Baha'u'llah. That is the enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends as will extend to the range of human inventions and technical development, to the increase of the productivity of mankind, to the extermination of disease, to the extension of scientific research, to the raising of the standard of physical health, to the sharpening and refinement of the human brain, to the exploitation, that is the use, management, utilization, development of the unused and unsuspected resources of the planet, to the prolongation of human life, to the furtherance of any other agency that can stimulate the intellectual, the moral, and spiritual life of the entire human race. Fundamentally, such reflections lead to the reality of our times, that there is significant imbalance and discordance between advancements in science and advancement in spirituality. Spirituality has not advanced in line with advancement in science and technology. These have not been in synchrony, since science and spirituality have not advanced progress in tandem. We have progressed materially, but not spiritually. Some may even hold that we have advanced in science and technology, but have indeed regressed in spirituality. Material and spiritual advancements must go hand in hand. Both are essential to the progress of civilization. Material civilization is like the lamb, but the spiritual civilization is like the light in the lamb. This lamb without the light is a useless thing. Now at the conclusion of this presentation, we continue to ponder and reflect on the Baha'i principle of the harmony of science and religion, the ethical challenge posed by biotechnology. This presentation was centered on this theme and the ethical challenge posed by this principle, by biotechnology, notably by biotechnology or genetic engineering. This presentation was based on some of the current knowledge in the field of biotechnology. With the passage of time, the increasing development of novel biotechnologies are bound to provide yet greater benefits. They're also bound to pose yet new 
and yet greater challenges. Once again, the viewer will be left with that fundamental enigmatic question. Can biotechnology serve as a boon? On one hand, novel biotechnologies through the great benefits they impart are bound to serve as boon and greater boon for humankind. Yet on the other hand, they may pose more serious, egregious concern, the gloom and greater gloom for humankind. Biotechnologies hold enormous value, yet they can also pose serious challenges. May humankind advance in line with that higher level of spirituality, conducive to an ever-continuing boon toward human well-being and felicity. At this, the conclusion of this presentation, I wish to express my appreciation to the viewers of this presentation for their interest and the investment of their time in listening to and viewing this presentation, which was centered on one of the greatest scientific discoveries of our times. I appeal to the viewers to reflect on the implications of the fundamental high principle of the harmony of science and religion for this and future generation toward the progress and well-being of humankind. As biotechnologies continue to advance, new possibilities, new challenges, new questions, both beneficial as well as dire, will continue to engage and intrigue humanity. Will such ever ongoing advances continue to serve as a greater boon or more dismal gloom to humankind? Or will they continue to serve as both boon and also gloom? Such questions underscore the importance of exercise of caution and also maintaining balance and vigilance toward harmony between science and spirituality. Thank you, dear Dr. Khadem Khadadad. Truly informative and enlightening. Um, 